Okay, it is 11 o'clock, so I'm just going to go ahead and go over some housekeeping items, and then I am going to turn over the time to Andrew and Kelly and Representative Brian King. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for, I believe it's event number three so far. Today, we are going to be hosting Representative Brian King, who's running for governor here in the state of Utah. A couple of really quick housekeeping items. Um, we do have an ASL interpreter here today. She should be able to be seen at any time, but if you are having any issues or need her pinned or spotlit, please let me know and I'd be happy to assist you. Um, I have opened up the chat, so you should be able to use that in order to communicate with me and with others. Um, if you do have any questions that you want to remain anonymous or simply love using the Q&A feature on Zoom webinar, um, you are welcome to do that. You can find that in your Zoom panel as well. Of course, there's also closed captioning. You can find that in your Zoom uh, webinar panel as well and turn those on. And I think that that is it for me. I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Kelly Hess, who's with the Institute for Disability, Andrew Riggle, who's with the Disability Law Center. They are both of our um, facilitators for today's event. And we are really excited to welcome Representative Brian King here, uh, who is going to be answering some questions that we have. So thank you, everyone. And uh, take us away, you two. All right. Um, Representative King, thank you so much for meeting with us today. We're, we're excited to hear from you. I'm going to go ahead and read your bio. Brian King is a husband, father, grandfather, and attorney running to serve as your next governor. In his legal career, Brian sues some of the biggest insurance companies in the world on behalf of people who have, claim, have had claims wrongfully denied. He is proud to have spent decades representing the interests of everyday people against powerful corporations. Brian's work representing District 23 in the Utah House of Representatives for the last 16 years has had a similar focus representing the people and fighting for the interests against their interests against entrenched politicians, influential special interest groups, and giant corporations. He's no stranger to a David and Goliath battle, and as governor, he will advocate for Utahns who are being left behind. Brian believes that Utahns deserve better, and he is running to put results over rhetoric and public service over personal interest. Brian, Brian is building a coalition of pragmat, pragmatists made up of Utahns from all, from all political affiliations and backgrounds. If you're tired of the division, the extremism, and the chaos, if you're looking for a leader who will always stand up for what's right, then join us for the better. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the first question. Um, as a candidate re representing all you Tongs, please share with us your vision and or mission on how you plan to serve the people of Utah, including those with disabilities. Well, thank you, first of all, uh, for having me. Thank you, Kelly, for that kind introduction. I know you just read the, something that my team gave you, but uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to this community. It's it hits close to home for me. My work as a lawyer is uh, for 25 or 30 years now, probably over 30 years, has been representing folks who've had denied life and health and disability claims. Uh, most of my work involves denied mental health and substance use disorder claims. But uh, for these three decades that I've been working in this area, I've always represented individuals who have denied disability claims. And um, it, it's, of course, I don't need to tell this group of uh, folks how challenging it is to, uh, you know, get through uh, a day-to-day -day, uh, functional existence where you're trying to make ends meet and trying to uh, provide for yourself and your family, um, the loved ones that you have. Uh, that's a challenging thing for all of us, but it's particularly challenging for folks with disabilities. And accessing the things that a lot of us uh, take for granted is something that um, just isn't part of the disability community. I mean, it's. We, I was looking at some of the sections of the ADA 
uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act that uh, talk about communication and transportation, uh, job discrimination, um, government services, access to government services. And there are so many ways in which individuals who are uh, struggling with disabilities are impaired in their ability to access those things, uh, like I say, that the rest of us take for granted. And so one of the things that you would see as part of my administration as governor is sensitivity to an awareness of the kinds of things that individuals with disabilities uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. One of my uh, first experiences as a lawyer, in fact, it was my first uh, oral argument that I ever gave was uh, a case against Steve Makita, who many of many on this uh, call on this Zoom meeting are going to know. Steve was uh, a formidable advocate for uh, the state of Utah. He served as an assistant attorney general for many years, but uh, he was uh, impaired to a significant degree in terms of his uh, movement and spent his life in a wheelchair, basically. But that did not keep him from being a tremendous public servant for Utah. And for close to 40 years, he worked. Uh, sadly, Steve's no longer with us, but uh, he was a good friend. And, and one of the formative uh, people that I worked with in my law career. Uh, when I was first elected uh, as a, and in fact, it was before I was elected, but I was running for office, Jan Ferre approached me, one of the uh, leaders of the uh, Coalition for People with Disabilities at the legislature approached me and said, there are some things I want you to know about, Brian. And I spent about three hours in her home uh, this was before my first election, and she said, if you're going to work and represent our district you uh, and you want my support, you're going to need to be sensitive about these things. And just in a torrent of information, she told me all sorts of things about uh, what resources were available from the state of Utah, how the state of Utah was supporting people with disabilities, and how they were failing people with disabilities. And so that's the kind of thing I think that more than most uh uh, people who are running for public office, my life experience, my work as an attorney, my work as a legislator over the last 16 years, my work as a leader over eight of those 16 years as uh, the head, the leader of the House Minority Caucus, I think prepares me well to uh, ensure that there is an understanding of and a sensitivity to the issues that individuals who are struggling uh, with disabilities are dealing with and one of the commitments that I would make to the uh, people with, uh, to the community of people with disabilities is to say, I would love to have somebody, uh, uh, to, to have more than just one person, to have individuals who have experienced themselves with disabilities serving in my cabinet, serving uh, as close advisors, serving in a way that ensures uh, and will ensure that uh, I continue to make, to, to uh, have policies and uh, act and speak in a way that's close to the ground and uh, close to the hearts and minds of people uh, who are living with disabilities in our state. Thank you so much for your response and your thoughtful answer. Hi, hi Representative. Thing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing um, your uh, your background and your and the beginning of your perspective. I have a question for you on uh, education, and that is, many students in Utah take advantage uh, take advantage of programs such as career and technical education, college readiness preparation, and internships. However, students with disabilities are largely excluded from these programs, despite being able to participate in them if provided with the proper supports. How will you ensure students with disabilities have equal access to the same programs and opportunities as their non-disabled peers? Andrew, thank you for that question. And, and first, let me thank you, Andrew, for your years of incredible committed service on behalf of the uh, disability community. I think I can't remember a time when I've been at the legislature when you haven't been there. And you've been there every day, dude. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Um, as you know, CTE particularly, uh, and other programs that we're talking about that you referenced 
oftentimes deal with the partnership between public and private uh, entities. So you've certainly got the system of higher education and our secondary education system within public education that is um, intimately involved in making sure that students have opportunities to get training uh, for jobs that don't involve just your sort of uh, typical uh, system of graduating from high school and then going on to higher education to get a degree, uh, you know, in advanced, either a bachelor's degree or a, a, an advanced degree beyond that. So you've got better, um, we've developed over the last few years in Utah, and I think this is true across the country, better systems for making sure that individuals who want to uh, go through a system of um, uh, college education beyond high school, that they can get into uh, career and technical education and, and, uh, and areas where there is a need for uh, more, uh, you know, not your typical college education where you just get a bachelor's degree in English or history or policy or something like that. And that's a good thing because we need to make sure that our workforce is uh, tailored to address the needs, uh, the vocational needs uh, of our workforce today. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, Silicon Slopes kind of jobs, IT jobs, things like that. And there's a lot of uh, technical kind of jobs. So we can, we have, and we must continue to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place for uh, public education, the secondary education system, you know, middle schools and high schools, as well as our higher education system to address the needs of uh, our workforce in the community right now. And part of your question that I hear you saying is uh, there are deficiencies in how those public and higher education systems address the needs of individuals with disabilities. I think we've got to make sure that we have uh, mechanisms in place, whether it's higher education or uh, public education, secondary schools, to address those needs. That's the first part. So I would want to listen carefully. I think what's important is, you know, I come to this job as governor, uh, as a lawyer who I've worked with people who have disabilities, but there's a lot of uh, information that I haven't had access to and don't have access to right now that I need to learn. So I would want to listen to people within the community Disability Law Center, uh, the Institute up at uh, USU, and other uh, places where people with disabilities would say, look, Governor, you need to understand this, that, and the other and, and work on those things. That's number one. Number two, to address the, the second aspect of so much of what happens on vocational training for our students is we've got to make sure that we communicate an expectation and a desire to private entities who are working hand in glove with people in the state of Utah to put together these public-private partnerships that we want them to accommodate and to make room for individuals who uh, have disabilities that we are able to say to them, the companies that is, you, we expect you to make a place for individuals who have disabilities but who can do the work if they're accommodated. Accommodations, of course, are critically important. It's part of the ADA. Uh, it's something that we want employers to provide to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and so I, I think that what would be critical in terms of what I would do as governor is to express my expectation, express the expectation of the state of Utah to employers, this is what we need you to do. This is what we expect of you. If we're going to have a public-private relationship uh, where, you know, we assist you in providing trained workers and you assist us in making, uh, a, you know, putting in place jobs for those individuals, that there is a recognition of and a sensitivity to the needs of individuals struggling, struggling with disabilities and that you make room for them and accommodate them. So I think that would be a critical part of what we're doing here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your, that vision, Representative. Thank you. So your next question is, it kind of leads right into it. It's talking about employment opportunities. And current data shows that individuals with any disability in Utah have a community-based employment rate 
of 53% compared to the overall employment rate of 78% for all Utahns. This is cited by the American Community Survey that was done in 2021. Many Utahns with disabilities can and want to work, but don't have access to the supports necessary to find and retain employment. How will you work to increase employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities in Utah, ensuring they receive the necessary supports and accommodations for job success? Thank you, Kelly, for that question. It's an excellent one. I think DWS, the Department of Workforce Services, is um, has done some very good things in terms of making sure that there are resources available for individuals with disabilities and that we uh, adapt to, we, we provide those resources and, and helps the assistance to individuals to prepare them to be employed. Um, that's something that I would wanna take a close look at to see how we can improve those processes, how can we, we can supplement and improve those resources. The DWS, of course, is a key uh, uh, piece of this whole process to make sure that individuals within the state of Utah have available to them what they need to ensure that they can work and get the jobs that they need. And I want to just say one of the things that's important about this question that you ask, in my own work uh, helping individuals uh, whose disability benefits have been denied, you know, there's a suspicion on the part of many people that if you give individuals who claim to be disabled any slack or, you know, that you have to be suspicious, that you have to be questioning of whether they're legitimate. My own experience is that the vast, vast majority of individuals that I've represented would like nothing better than to work and get back to work if there's been an accident or an illness who is, that has been disabling for them. So I recognize that work is key to not just economic well-being for Utahns, but it's key to mental and emotional well-being. And that's something that I've experienced and seen in my own work as an attorney representing individuals who've been trying to get disability benefits. They'd like nothing better than to get back to work. And I think that's true. The numbers that you cited, Kelly, uh, are concerning because I do think that to the extent that we can work and provide for ourselves as human beings, that's gonna contribute significantly, not just to our financial well-being, but to how we feel about ourselves, how uh, emotionally and mentally uh, uh, well off we are. And so I, I just want to echo the idea that how important it is that individuals who uh, are, are working with disabilities or struggling with disabilities, but want to work and are able to work if they have accommodations, that they have that opportunity. Uh, so I think that uh, one of the other, the last thing I'd say in answer to your question is, again, there's place and there's room for the state of Utah and the executive branch of the state of Utah, the governor's office of the state of Utah to express the hope, the expectation, and the need for private employers to make reasonable uh, and necessary accommodations for individuals who can do the job, who want to do the job, and uh, are not able to simply because an employer doesn't reasonably make relatively simple and straightforward accommodations we are still continuing to deal with a stigma toward individuals with disabilities. And that stigma arising to the uh, extent that it is an outright bias and prejudice at times is real. I think it's been diminished significantly with the passage of the ADA and with greater awareness and sensitivity to how we deal with individuals with disabilities. To, I think it's also uh, been, uh, we've been sensitized to the fact that most of us have some limitation, some disability, if you will, in terms of our own functionality. And at least that's true for many of us and, and that we ought to be aware of and uh, appreciative of the degree to which individuals with disabilities want to be involved. Sometimes the disabilities, of course, are more extensive than other times. But the point is simply, we shouldn't just uh, preclude those individuals in our attitudes or in our actual behaviors or practices from having a meaningful part in our economic workplace settings. So I think uh, we can convey that expectation as a state to employers to say, we need you, we want you, and we expect you, we require of you when there are uh, abilities to require it, that you accommodate, make reasonable accommodations for individuals who are uh, working with disabilities. 
Thank you so much for, for your answer. Representative, we have a little under 10 minutes left and I have a question for you on uh, related to community integration. Accessible infrastructure is critical to Utahns with disabilities in order to live, work, and participate in their communities. Increased access in areas such as uh, public, uh, public transportation, sidewalks, buildings, and physical or online information will allow for greater community integration for Utahns. How will you help our state and community be more supportive of people with disabilities and their families? Thank you, Andrew. Of course, the ADA sort of forms the backbone of what is our, our requirements at a federal level. I think it's worth taking a hard look at what we can do at the state level to put in place some uh, legal requirements that are reasonable and will lead to greater productivity and uh, uh, greater functionality for individuals, not just with disabilities, but for all of us as Utahns if we can do some things that move above and beyond the ADA in areas that uh, are available to us. I'd want to look at what other states have done. Uh, I don't come to this conversation today with a list of things that I can think of off the top of my head that we could do and ought to do to move us ahead in these areas involving public transportation or any other area that would advance the uh, welfare of individuals struggling with disabilities and advance the welfare of all of us as Utahns. Um, but I do feel strongly that if you can't get to a location and you are uh, impaired to some degree in terms of your mobility or in terms of your ability to use uh, conventional public uh, transportation, you know, it's going to have a significant uh, restricting ability on your uh, access to work, your uh, access to quality of life. And again, one of the things I think is critically important is that people realize it's not just a question of helping individuals who are struggling with disabilities of one type or another. This is an area where it impacts for better or worse, the quality of life of all of us, individuals who don't think of themselves as disabled and, and may not be disabled to a meaningful degree in any uh, real sense, are going to have the quality of their lives improved if they have better access to and interaction with relationships with individuals who 40 years ago or even five, 10 years ago, they may not have had an opportunity to work with or to socialize with or to spend time with. We, in other words, need to integrate ourselves. And as we do so, we're going to, all of us, improve our quality of life. It's certainly true for individuals who have disabilities, but it's true for individuals who don't have disabilities too. So this idea of sort of improving quality of life for everybody and improving, uh, having dis improving the lives of people with disabilities, improving the quality of life of everyone, I think is very real. On your specific point, Andrew, about public transportation, I'd love to get more information about some of the specifics uh, that, that we can do to move that forward. Uh, because I think to the extent that we can do that uh, and have it be manageable and feasible and see what other states are doing, they're always that's the nice thing about being one of 50 states is we can always look around and borrow the good ideas from other states. Doesn't matter whether it's a red state or a blue state. One of the things that I've been concerned about on the part of our current governor is this constant demonization of a state that lies to our west and Everybody knows who I'm talking about. I don't care what whether it's a blue state or a red state. If you got a good idea, uh, well, I want to be looking at it as governor of the state of Utah and bringing it to Utah, regardless of whether it's a Democratic or a, a Republican state. So I, I'm all ears on this. Thank you, Representative. Kelly? All right. The next question pertains to mental health. Um, a recent report from the IDRPP shows that 61% of Utahns with intellectual and developmental disabilities also have co-occurring mental health diagnoses. However, mental health services in Utah are not currently accessible for individuals, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. How will you address the mental health needs of Utahns with disabilities, particularly those in rural areas? Boy, Kelly, thank you for that question. Um, we're making progress, hopefully, 
across the country and in Utah and how we deal with mental health uh, and uh, intellectual and behavioral disabilities. I'm concerned, I've been concerned for a long time. There's a question in the chat about DSPD wait list. That's something that uh, Democrats in the legislature have worked on for a long time. Uh, my friend Jennifer Daly Provo has worked on it and tried to get greater funding for it. It's a slow, it's a real struggle. There is uh, a need for that. And um, then it ties directly into uh, mental health and uh, and also substance use disorders when you're talking about issues involving uh, uh, those who are struggling with disabilities and, and not just that, of course, but those are the kind of things that I just think we've got to put more time and energy into addressing. And um, I would certainly look for additional funding to reduce the DSPD wait list. I would uh, make sure that we provide, I think we have a crying need uh, for individuals across the state of Utah, whether it's the youth in our schools or whether it's uh, individuals uh, who are struggling with disabilities, a crying need for greater resources for mental health clinicians, clinical services. Uh, we're making progress in facilitating that by building up our foundation in higher education to ensure that we, we have resources to train individuals who want to go into those areas, but we need to do a lot more. Um, so I, I just think one of the ways in which we can address that is, um, you know, we've got problems with Medicaid uh, uh, waiting lists or, or individuals who qualify for Medicaid, especially children, and who don't get on the uh, enroll uh, list for Medicaid. That's a problem. Uh, we're 50th in the country in our uptake for children who qualify for Medicaid but aren't uh, actually uh, signed up. We can do a much better job on that. Um, we can, we can, there, there are so many ways in which we can address this. I, I'd like to have our Department of Health and Human Services functional, functionally take a closer look at these issues and do the best job that they can, do a better job than they're doing. I mean, they're working hard. I'm not faulting them. I'm just saying there are ways in which we can improve how we handle those issues right now. And it's critically important that we do so. Okay. Representative, we wanted uh, we want to make sure to give you uh, a minute or two for a final statement, if you'd like, and then we'll and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you, uh, Andrew. You know, I I one of the things that informs my thinking about this is my own. Uh, I, I say to people, some people say you're LDS, aren't you? And I say, yeah, I am LDS, and I'm uh, a Democrat because of my LDS faith and. Um, one of the things that's critical, I think, is to make sure that we uh, look at the needs of those who have been marginalized and who are most vulnerable uh, in our community, whether it's children, whether it's the elderly, whether it's individuals struggling with disabilities, whether it's individuals and groups who have been discriminated against and we've had bias toward in the past. Those voices need to be brought to the table and heard to a greater extent than they have been. We need to lift them up. We need to uh, be sensitive to them. We need to gain greater understanding and knowledge about what they need and what they want from us. The quality of life, not just for them, but for all of us as Utahns, is going to be enhanced to the extent that we do that. So that's what I would like to do as your governor. It's what I'm committed to doing as your governor. We've gone now for four decades without having balance in our Utah state government. Over four decades since Scott Matheson was the governor in 1984, We've only had one party control of both the legislature and the governor's office. We can do so much better than that uh, by, by allowing uh, different ideas to be brought to the table and uh, having the best of those opposing those uh, ideas, those competing ideas fall out for the benefit of the people of the state of Utah. So uh, that's what I would say in conclusion. I'd love to have the support of individuals within the disability community uh, and uh, I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you about these things. Thank you so much, Representative. Uh, Kelly, would you like to take us out or would you like me to do it? Either way, I just, I really want to say thank you, um, Representative King, thank you for your time. Um, this, this is a strong group of, it's, 
we're a strong community of people with disabilities, um, but we're often overlooked. And I think we're a powerful force when it comes to um, caring about political ideas. And so we just really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts with us on some of these, these questions and topics that are important to us. You're welcome. Thank you. And I'll just fin I'll just finish with uh, two quick things, and the and that it, and first is uh, uh, as Kelly said, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, please do so um, again on uh, Wednesday at noon when we'll be hearing from uh, uh, Caroline uh, Caroline Gleick, who is running uh, for Senate, and I will just. Um, uh, wrap up with a reminder that um, the um, last day to re uh, the last the last day to register to vote by mail is October twenty fifth. But you can uh, but you can uh, register and vote at any um, early voting location as well as uh, you can register in person at your polling place on November 5th, which is election day. And finally, uh, for folks with uh, disabilities for whom it might be uh, it might be a useful option, uh, the state of Utah now has the now has the option for uh, folks with disabilities who qualify to uh, vote electronically using uh, their own device like a, a phone, tablet, or a computer. And to find out um, uh, if you qualify and how to and how to register for that option, if you would like to, uh, you can uh, contact your county clerk's office, and they will uh, and they will guide you through that process. If you would like um, more information on uh, the election and voting processes um, in general, you, uh, please feel free to visit uh, the Disability Law Center's. Uh, voting rights page. And with that, uh, we'll again thank you for your time and hope to see you again on Wednesday. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mikkel, for your signing. We appreciate you. And thank you again, Representative King, for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.